fingerprints and she's one of five percent of the population she doesn't have it. Yeah. <laughs> As I said, so if you know I'm going to get this one, she's pulled back and I'm thinking I'm going to try to, yeah, track her down. She's walked off with the money. Yeah, she was. say real quick yesterday we had our Christmas around the world uh, Christmas meal for the church and it was phenomenal uh, we praise God we ran out of chairs so, uh, you might think well that's I don't know if that's a praise or not but some of us stood and we were having a, the time of our lives it was a wonderful wonderful time so so thank you to all who came and all prayed for that event uh, we, we got to minister to people that we don't see here on Sunday mornings, and we got to really connect with, with some wonderful, wonderful people. So, fill out the connection card. I've already said that, but I have a few announcements for us. Uh, on uh, Friday, December 9th, from 5.30 to 7.30 at the church, that's going to be a fun time, and pizza is always a fun time. So, so just wanted to remind you of that. There's no midday Bible study until... January 11th on Wednesdays, and, and if you have some time on Wednesdays, whenever these are going on, I really invite you to come. It's usually in this room up here in the corner, but we'll be here for, uh, is it 10 a.m.? 10 a.m.? Okay. I, can't, I always get 10, 10, 30, and so. But we're not having that again until January 11th. We're going to be caroling on December 10th, this is for everyone, not just for children, or not just for one particular age group, but everyone caroling at Brookside, uh, December 10th at 2 p.m., so that's in the middle of the day. Because this is an assisted living facility, we are saying that we need to wear masks to that event, uh, because they have had, uh, a few weeks ago, had a, an outbreak uh, of COVID, but that's now subsided and everything's good. But, but we just want to be, you know, it's a way to minister to them, you know. Also, 
Uh, the next Brookside service in which um, Pastor Margie is going to be going over to the assisted living facility is December uh, 11th. And that's going to actually be at 10 a.m. instead of 10.30 a.m. like normal. No, it's always 10 a.m. Oh, it's always 10 a.m. I'm sorry. We start, <laughs> we start at 10.30, then we move to 10 a.m. and now it's been 10 a.m. Oh, God. I got it. Okay. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm with us. So uh, those are the announcements for today as we continue to worship. Would you stand? As we pray. Father, thank you for this day. We thank you for your abundant love. We thank you for this reminder as, as we are celebrating Advent. We are awaiting the Messiah and we're celebrating that, that anticipation that we get when it comes to the work and the power of Christ. We thank you for today. We ask that you bless this service. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 of a world without Christ and the light of a world with Christ. We see the light coming, yet it hasn't fully come. Advent is the season of the dawn. While we observe this season of Christ's birth and the coming of light, we are reminded that we are still an Advent people. We live in the glow of the dawn. We are no longer people of darkness. We are people of the light, even while Christ's return is still before us. We are people of the dawn. On the first Sunday of Advent, we light this candle of hope, a reminder of the hope we have in Christ, who came in a stable so long ago. But it's also a reminder of the hope we have that Christ will come again. We are people of the light in a world that is still so often cloaked in darkness. We are people of the light. We have hope that the light has come and that the light is coming. If you bow your heads with me and pray. Lord, help us remember that we are people of the dawn and people of hope. In the places that still harbor darkness, help us to shine your light. And in the places that are already illuminated with your light, help us rejoice. Help us cling to hope through it all. Amen. Amen. Our ushers are going to come. If you consider Fisher's Point to be your church home and would like to get to the ministry of Fisher's Point, we can do that this time. <laughs> Oh, God. 
familiar, but maybe a little unfamiliar because we've changed up the words a little bit. This is Jesus Messiah, the version. <laughs>
say something that uh, I as your pastor would not be here today if it weren't because of some lady being born uh, a, a handful of years ago <laughs> today it's my mother's birthday today uh, so everyone she's she's the however many years old that you have <laughs> so I wanted to say that out loud and I think it's important I mean I think it's uh yeah, it's, important. Day. It's, important. <laughs> it's appropriate to talk about during the Advent season because of, you know, thinking about Mary giving birth to a perfect baby. My mother gave birth to a perfect baby. Oh, yeah. So, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, my brother, my brother. Have you ever felt like, all right, something. I have you ever have you ever felt like that you don't exactly fit the mold for something that we feel called religious? Like you you might not um, you might not feel like you have the look for a, being an accountant, whatever that means. Okay. I know I know for me, for for instance, when God called me to ministry, you know I was looking at this is a real problem. I mean, this was a real problem for me and my insecurities. A church planter who pastored a church was a person who was tall, <laughs> had a wonderful, beautiful haircut, uh, wore skinny jeans, you know, and all those kind of things. Now, I have the handsome down. I think that's okay. <laughs> but then the, the, the hair... <laughs> the, 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 yeah, yeah. But, 
<laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, the insecurities that come along with um, understanding what it means to fit a certain mold, the expectations that come along with whatever you do in life, you have to have a certain look or a certain. Uh, Yes, Lord. <laughs> a certain swagger about you, or whatever the case may be. I think that it can really mess with us sometimes. Whenever we are, whenever we're really getting into doing whatever we're called to do. In ancient times, this was a problem as well. In ancient times, for instance, we're going to be talking about this concept of being a messenger. And in those times, if you're like a postal messenger or you're just kept carrying a message from one place to another, there's a certain look about you, there's a certain attitude that you have. A, a messenger was really respected, you know, but they were kind of in the background. A person who would bring mail or a person who would bring some sort of message, whether it be from a king that was a high honor or, or someone who, who had um, a very important message, First of all, this person was respected. This person was harmless. It's not like they're gonna they're gonna hurt anyone. But they were kind of in the background, and they were kind of a person who, you know, you just knew were there. You know, they were a neutral party, if you will. I I actually experienced some of this back, uh, you know, years ago. Whenever I delivered edible arrangements, have you ever heard of that? Yeah. Edible arrangements. Everyone's like, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Edible arrangements are these uh, fruit baskets essentially covered in chocolate, and I won't go into detail, you get hungry. But I noticed that too, that even in the places that I might normally feel like would be the hardest places to go in town, that I felt safe because I was kind of invisible. Because I was, I was uh, just delivering fruit, and, and people respected me for that, I noticed. Uh, there was one particular instance in which I delivered fruit to a, a house, and, it, and I'm not trying to make light of this, I'm just giving you the information that, that this house had, the entire length of the house had bullet holes um, from one side to the other. So there was a little intimidation there. And uh, I, you know, I was the guy delivering the fruit basket. Another house, I, I walked in in the midst of a domestic uh, situation. Uh, some abuse happening, some yelling, some uh, probably cops being called, and I'm just like, I'm just dropping off some fruit. Let me get out here. Um, one instance in which I thought the person I was delivering the fruit to might have been either having a stroke or not in their right mind or something like that. So those kind of things happened. And, and um, But for the most part, I was kind of in the background. Like, I was just the guy delivering the fruit. Same thing with someone who's delivering your pizza or something like that. But in ancient times as well, it seemed like that these folks had a certain level of respect, and you would never expect them to be any other way than what we historically understood. This is why in the book of Judges, if you get in there, there's, a, there's one particular story that where God has called this man Ehud, uh, to to slay an evil king who is enslaving people and torturing people, killing people. And this man Ehud walks up to the king carrying a postal bag because he's supposed to be a a messenger. And Ehud was known as the left left-handed man, a left-handed warrior. So that's a very important detail in that particular story because you you generally gave messages with your left hand, but instead, in this particular case, he pulled out a sword, and there's the end of it. I'm, I'm giving you that information because when we say messenger, there's a very specific type of person that we're picturing. In today's context, you picture your, your postal lady, your postal man, or whoever. But in those cases, they had a very specific look, they had a very specific demeanor about them. They were respected. They were supposed to be kind of in the background. And this, whenever I'm giving a message, if I'm a person in this case, when I'm giving a message, 
there's a certain amount of decorum that, with giving that message. There's a certain song and dance you did a little bit, you know, that you had to, you were fitting in a mold. A person fitting outside of that mold would not be believed if they were saying that they were a messenger. And you don't look the part. You, know, you don't look like a messenger, whatever that means. But we get the idea of what I'm trying to convey. Matthew chapter 3 introduces us to a messenger. And in this series that we're doing, Let Us Adore Him for the Advent Season, we know who the hymn is. We know that we're leading in this, in this mentality of Advent, we're learning about and we're anticipating the coming Messiah. And in, in today's day and age, we are celebrating that anticipation. So we know the hymn, we know Jesus is the hymn, let us, who is us? Well, all of us, those who count ourselves blessed enough to be found under the fold of Jesus Christ, we are adoring him. What does the word adore mean? It means just to sit and anticipate, and it means to just soak in the awe that is who we are worshiping. Amen. So when we adore someone, or when we adore something, that is a different word than this adore. If I'm going to adore a piece of cake, or a, 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 it would be irresponsible of me to use that same word or that same feeling when I say, I adore my wife. But then that, even further than that, it would be inappropriate if I'm having the same feeling and thought process when I'm talking about the creator of the universe. So sometimes we can get into this mentality where we go to a restaurant, or we go and, and watch a play or a movie, and we use that word love. Oh, I love that movie, or I love that sandwich, or I love that restaurant, or I love that, you know, whatever the case may be, we use that same word over and over and over as if it means something, and it eventually it just loses its meaning. Right. Because we love, love everything. Oh, man, I love that. I love this pen. This is great. You know, we, we have that mentality that we, we are trying to just kind of use for everything. Adore is the same way. I adore, you know, those around me. I adore, but I adore... If you know what I'm trying to say, I adore the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, who came and saved you. That's a different word. Amen. Let us adore him. So we are taking, we are starting out in this series, what I was getting at earlier, we're starting out in this series talking about the anticipation, and then I'm just going to let you in on the punchline. We're going to talk about the coming at the end of the year, right? at the end of the uh, season here. The anticipation and the payoff. These are the things that we talk about during the Advent season. One of the comments that that one of the teens made today in in youth in the youth Sunday school, I said we talked about the Messiah. We're talking about Advent. We're talking about all of that. And I, I said, just what, general comments. What do you got? One of them raised their hand, or or he just said it. He said. They had to wait a long time, didn't they? They looked look at Abraham and God making promises. Well, even if you look at Adam and Eve and, and we messed up, how are we going to reconcile that? How are we going to, it's not, it can't just be a band-aid of relationships. And, and then here we go, Abraham came. And then the uh, King David came and they thought, oh, King David, he's the guy. He must be the guy. Look, he's, he's living a perfect life. And he's a ruler. And man, he, he has unlimited rule, uh, essentially. And then David messed up. He sinned. And they thought, nope, that's not him. So imagine living back then with so many all boasts, but disappointments. And to the point where you just gave up. He just gave up. Well, he's not coming. Either we messed something up or we just got the whole message wrong. So we're celebrating this whole Advent season of the anticipation and the culmination. So in 
in Matthew chapter 3, and I'm just going to read a little snippet of this, because I think it's important for us to understand what this man says, that we, we're introduced to a messenger. So if you're in the mind, ancient mindset, you're picturing someone, a kind of person. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Now, in this little snippet, I'm not getting a whole lot of uh, detail about what this person looks like, but I'll get into that in just a moment. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who has spoken of, of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. We could just read that snippet and just move on, right? Uh, we're reading in that little snippet that, that someone is coming who is going to fulfill everything that we've been disappointed about. We've been waiting for this moment. And those ancient folks, if they would have heard just that, that portion, there's two, two reactions that would have come. One is, all right, finally, it's here. The other one's like, yeah, you keep saying that. And we keep being disappointed. But what would have added some, what would have added credibility or non-credibility to this, to this story or to this message? If you go on, if you, and I'm not going to read every word of this, but I do want to describe this guy that is the messenger. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. Okay, what? And he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all of Judea and the whole region of Jordan. We, 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 and then he, we describe his disciples and things like that. So this man comes in, beard disheveled, probably long hair. He hasn't showered in a while or whatever. This guy does not look the part. He doesn't fit the mold. But all of a sudden he comes because he knows the background story. He knows what is coming. And he, his job is not only to prepare these folks for what is about to come, the, the best thing you could ever imagine, but also to provide them with hope. Amen. This is not just some hope of like, well, I hope I get an A in my next class. This is everything that you've been disappointed about. Every time you have reached out to the heavens, for rescue. Every time you have felt so alone, this answer is coming. <clears throat> and actually, he's here. Yeah. So Matthew chapter 3 tells us this whole story, and it's, and it's laying out this wonderful, literarily, it's, it's phenomenal. It, it helps us to anticipate something that we have been disappointed about and perhaps a thought process that we put on the shelf for a while. Well, this is not going to happen. It's been 2,000 years since God promised Abraham something. But there was going to be a, a way that all of this was going to be reconciled and restored and renewed. But 2,000 years, my goodness, that's a long time. Just be honest about that. Have you ever had a prayer in your life where you where you've been praying to God and you just were honest and said, God, this has been too long. It's been way too long. Either you have forgotten about me, or maybe you've changed your mind, but I felt like you told me something very specific at this point in time, and now it's just too long. I mean, at this point, the expiration date is gone. Even though I'm the one who created the expiration date. But you know, you have that feeling, right? 
You have that little, maybe timer in your mind or in your heart where it's gone off, it's done. We put it aside. And this is what the Israelite people were all about. Or this is what they were going through. So John quotes Isaiah. Specifically Isaiah 43, 40, chapter 40, verse 3. When, when he's talking about a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Isaiah was writing this because Isaiah was in the midst of this time period in which they were exiled once again. A, a different nation had come in, taken all their stuff, scattered the Israelite people, and now Isaiah was really feeling like if God was going to do a work, here's the only one, one way he could do it. Is let's just have another exodus, just like we did before. Another exodus, let's select a new Moses, let's 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 do all this all over again. And I feel like we've gotten the hang of this. We're gonna do it right this time. That was Isaiah. He was saying that. So in his mind, God was was showing him new rescue, renewal, something new coming. The Messiah is, is coming. Get ready, get my people ready for them. And Isaiah was saying, okay, then that must be a Moses, a, a new Exodus, you know, something else like that. So John comes in, you know, hundreds of years later, and they're in an exile again. And we might not call it official exile because they're all staying in the same place, pretty much. But there's a new nation that's completely in control, the Roman nation. And it's essentially an exile again. So here comes John from out of the wilderness. He's not from, he didn't, he didn't exit out of the university. We didn't catch him walking out of Harvard. And he didn't have his graduation cap on and his gown. He had camel's hair, a leather belt, and this guy looks like he hasn't bathed in a long time. He didn't fit the part. So he begins to speak these words that were also spoken and written by Isaiah, among others in the Old Testament. That he is telling them, using these words, that your rescue is actually here now. Praise God. We would think that that would be met with extreme applause. The crowd's going wild, finally. But what we see later on here is that, well, yeah, I mean, they were able to gain some disciples from that, but it was pretty much not the big crowd affair that we would think. John didn't fit the part. He didn't look the part. He didn't speak the same way as a messenger did. He didn't hold the same kind of overwhelming authority, or he, he, he didn't seem to, to grasp what it meant to have a good demeanor as a messenger. But yet God used him to show these people that hope is here. We always think about this idea of hope being in the future, that something will never attain. But hey, at least we can make ourselves happen and think it's going to happen. But John was saying a very important and, and very odd thing when he, when he was talking about hope. He was not only saying the hope is in the future, but hope, hope has arrived. The thing that you've been hoping for, those things that you've been disappointed about, the things that you have raised your fist and shook your fist up in the air and said, when, Lord, the, the expiration date's here. Might as well not even come anymore. But now John is saying, actually, all of that, God had perfect timing, all that is here now. Let me introduce you to him. Later on, we see Jesus coming onto the scene, and there's some amazing things happening with his ministry and all of that. This story happened later on in life of Jesus, but we didn't know who Jesus was until that moment. Really. I mean, we as the reader did. Because we kind of knew we could skip ahead a little bit. Oh, is that the guy? 
But imagine being in that scenario. I, I, would, I would be very intimidated. Like, do I, am I worthy? Am I worthy to convey the message that hope is here? What if I get it wrong? What if it's not the right timing? They're going to all attack me because it's not happening this week. I'm going to get so many emails saying, hey, I thought you said this was happening today. I showed up and, there, and no one was there. But hope is here. John is trying to tell us a, a very important message. And sometimes we just kind of come to church on Sundays, maybe go to a Bible study, and we go about our week. But what would happen if we lived in the reality that hope is here and we have constant access to hope? That we can call upon the Holy Spirit at any point in time. And God hears us. And he responds to us. And, and sometimes, while this sounds great, I, I would rather not be comforted. I just want you to take it away. But God comforts us. And he grows us. And he guides us. So John is telling us, and John doesn't look the part, he doesn't speak the part, but, but he's showing us that no matter if you do or you don't, God can use you no matter where you're at in your life. And as we grow, he uses us more. Right. But he can use you for a miracle in the circles that you go around in. You can be someone's answer to prayer. Sure. So what are you doing today? Or today being pretty generic. What are you doing today that is declaring that hope is here? Do you adore him with your life? The things that you do, the things that you say, the way that you treat people, even if those people do not look, sound, or act like you do, are you still a person who declares with your life that you adore him and that hope is here? That, that's an intimidating thing to ask. Them. So as we transition, I'm going to call the, the praise team back up. We're, we're in this mode of transitioning from hope to peace. Whatever that means for us, we're going to talk about that next week. So, God can use you, and are you allowing him to use you? Right. If God has called you to something, are you stepping back and saying, no, Lord, this, that ship has already sailed? Or are you, are you constantly being open to his work and his power and his authority in your life. Right. What is he going to do with you? Don't you ever ask that out loud in the mirror? What is he going to do with me? If you open your heart up, I guarantee you it's going to be something that you can't predict. But it's going to be something that's world changing. Yeah.